All right, so good afternoon. It's a long, long day. You know, I'm not going to even talk for that long because it's the end of the day. I know you're probably tired. So um, I haven't got any slides or anything. Uh, what I want, I've been asked to talk to you about is black supplementary schools. Does anybody know much about black supplementary schools? Anybody know anything about black supplementary schools? A little bit? Just a little bit. What's the little bit that you know? Friends of mine who send their kids to black supplementary schools because they're they're just really not happy with what mainstream education is offering their children. Mm -hmm. uh, the, that they don't hear the stories, they don't hear about the people uh, that they want their children to hear about. So um, these are schools, in, from my understanding, set up by communities um, that run on Saturdays generally, uh, where parents can either go with their children or they can take their children away from there for the day. Yeah. Uh, so that so that they can hear about our people. Yeah, right. So, I mean, black supplementary schools are part of a broader approach of what we call supplementary education, which you find that mo every minority group has a supplementary school of some kind. Typically, it tends to be religious or cultural or language. What makes black supplementary schools different is it's not about culture. But, but, um, no, it is sort of about culture, but not primarily. Definitely not about religion and definitely not about language. Uh, black supplementary schools are historically have been existence in the UK for about 50 years. And this is black parents, predominantly Caribbean, or churches or teachers or just people in the community coming together and saying, we need to have special classes at the weekend, often, so they're called Saturday schools often, or after school, uh, which are for predominantly for black young people. So why do you think you would need a 50 year tradition of having a space that took black children uh, predominantly and taught them maths, English, science, etc., etc., as well as um, kind of black history stuff. What, what's the point? Why is that necessary? Do you think? Uh, yeah, potentially. Well, I do. Um, yes. A okay, I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to come back to yes. Wasn't there a uh, cap yeah? on achievement? A cap on achievement? What do you mean? Um, that, that they were actually kind of suppressed from achieving above a certain level. I don't know where, where I got that from, but I went on a black history walk and I seem to remember something like that being said. There's definitely been problems historically with achievement. So if you look at uh, how black young people do in schools, that's still today. It's still a problem. Back in the 60s, 70s, it was a much bigger problem, huge problem. Um, in fact, there was a book called How the West Indian Child is Made Educationally Subnormal by Bernard Cord. Anybody heard of that book? 71. Yes. Um, and basically, educationally subnormal is like what we call special needs now, effectively. And up to 70% of some black, uh, in some, was it Haringey? I was in an area in, um, in London, I think it was Haringey, up to 70% of black Caribbean boys were being de deemed to be educationally subnormal, special needs, right? Can't learn, or something wrong with them, right? So, yes, context of schools, attainment, etc., etc. Any other reason you think they'd be necessary? Yeah, it's very politicised to see certain agendas and every certain um, parts of education that is absolutely left out, which is not thought about in a certain way. Yes, there's a Mel Chavanez, who was in Wolverhampton, still he's still around, uh, said that it's not possible to supplement what does not exist. And if you actually look at the British school, education system, school system, curriculum, it really doesn't have much of black history, black studies in it. There's more so nowadays, but it's so peripheral and so minute that you really couldn't say it, it really exists, right? I think. So, in look, historically, certainly 50 years ago, it just wasn't there. So you've got those two big trends which are pushing the idea of supplementary schools. One, children doing very, very badly in schools. Uh, schools are failing them or maybe not failing them, depends on how we, depends on how we see it. And two, um, the curriculum is white, right? Why is my curriculum white, etc., etc. You all know this, I'm sure. I went through a whole entire school system, including university, with no, and I learned nothing about any black people ever. Like, not once. Like literally not once, right? Which is so surprise you because that's all I teach now, right? So actually, and this is something I will come back to at the end is that the school maybe can't. That's why I guess with the, with the failing you, can the school actually um, support you, right? Should you even be looking for the school to support you? That is another. There's a whole debate we're going to get into in the next few <laughs> minutes. All right. So I want to give you a bit of context. So that's the kind of the broad context. Right. So the context of Saturday, what we call Saturday schools, supplementary schools, unfortunately hasn't been lots and lots of work done. There's been some work done. Uh, I should probably plug my book on this. I actually wrote the book on the Black Supplementary School Movement, which just tells you how terrible our university system is. That something which existed for 50 whole years 
which has been a huge part of educational um, resistance and reform in the UK, and nobody had written about it until 2013, right? That's, those are the exclusions in our education system. Or I'll stop calling it education system and call it what it is, which is a school system. These are two very, very different things. All right, so I wanted to research Saturday schools. How did I get into Saturday schools? I wanted to do race and education. And if you look at, there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots about race and education, racism and education, and it's all top down, right? What do the schools do? What can the teachers do? What can the government do? Blah, 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 right? And what there wasn't, or hasn't been historically, is a focus on bottom up, grassroots. Look, schools are problematic. We know this. The police are problematic. We know this. The, the probably more interesting question is what do we do? How do we, how have we tried to overcome this? And how have we pushed uh, things forward, right? So my approach is to say, well, actually, let's look at Saturday schools, something which people had basically uh, neglected. That isn't how I got the money for my PhD. So my master's and PhD was funded, fully funded. Um, if I'd gone in and asked for funding to study the black elementary school <laughs> movement, I would have been told no straight away, geez. I actually went in and said, I wanted to study um, why black boys fail at school. And that's how I got uh, significant funding from the uh, <laughs> Economic and Social Research Council, which should also tell you something strategically. If anybody wants to go into research or PhDs, you just have to do something which they're going to like the sound of. Otherwise, you're not going to get the money. That's simple. All right. <laughs> so that's first lesson number one. All right. So when I actually got the money, then I did something completely different. I wanted to look at Saturday schools. We've done some of the context. The context um, is important and I think also ties into a, some of the things we're talking about around migration, about colonies, about the empire. So if you want to find the most pro-royalist, pro-empire people, go and find an old Caribbean person. Love the Queen. My, my grandma had a picture of the Queen right, right by the fridge there. Queen, 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 royal family, etc, etc. Because remember, we, these are people born in Colonies, right? Even my dad is not that old, was born in the colonies, right? Came over as a citizen, well, not a citizen, a subject of the British Empire. The Queen is still the head of state in many of these countries. And the royal family, Britain, has a very high status place, particularly for the older generation. And so when people were moving from the Caribbean to the UK, they weren't changing country, they were moving from one part of the country to another part of the country. Right? I think this, we, we often forget this. So my dad's passport, I found it, his original passport when he came over here. Um, it's just a, it's a British passport. It just says Jamaica on it, as though Jamaica is like Manchester, right? And so because of that, because that's how people came, when they, when they saw, when they thought of Britain, they thought of good schools, uh, they thought of good opportunity. People migrate for two basic reasons, for, for money and for better lives for their children. And they assumed that the school system in Britain would be great, right? Because this is, it's Britain. Of course it's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. So for a couple of years, people kind of just put their kids in the schools and accepted the schools would provide what the school should provide. And it was only around the late 60s that they started to realize this was not happening at all, right? And actually, in terms of that migration journey, it's only really the early 60s that you used to have large numbers of children coming into the schools anyway. And then by the late 60s, it's very, 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 very clear that the schools are not just not serving that purpose, they're actually harming the children, like significantly harming the children. As I said, up to 70% of black boys in some London boroughs being educationally subnormal. And this is where it's different, like I said, where Saturday schools, are, so many schools are different to other minority schools. This is predominantly the reason they came about was to teach maths English, the things which were supposed to be taught in the mainstream schools, alongside um, black history or black studies. Um, and what this meant was that, that people had no faith whatsoever in the school system. I'm going to give you a quote from someone called Maureen Stone. Anybody heard of Maureen Stone? Yeah. Yes. What do, you, do, you know, what do, you, what do you know anything about Maureen Stone? Anything about it? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. But remember, remember Maureen Stone. I'm going to give you one quote from Maureen Stone now, and I'm going to give you another quote later, and this hopefully makes sense. So Maureen Stone says that Caribbean, black, uh, West Indian children, West Indian families have no faith in the British school system. The schools are seen as colonizers in the community. Right? That's a quite radical thing to say. Schools are seen as colonizers. People go, they, they have no positive, beneficial role at all. That's the context with which Saturday schools emerged. They also emerged in a context of anti-racist education. So again, this is a thing you never get taught about. One of the things we really, really, really never get taught about is the anti-racist campaigns the, uh, in the UK. So in the UK, there was many, many, many post-war, pre-war uh, campaigns by communities, grassroots campaigns. Um, the Black Parents Movement, which was in Harringay in London, had a huge anti-banding campaign. And so banding is where they put you into um, sets, top set, bottom set, etc., etc., etc. And that's probably where you're getting the 
caps on attainment. So still on some exams, you can't get more than a C. At one point, you couldn't, on one exam, you can't get more than a D. Is that still true? Have they changed it? Oh, hopefully they changed that. I don't know. But uh, the, there's actually limits to what you can get if you're in particular, take particular exams. And obviously, what do we find? We find that black children are far more likely to be in these exams, which can never provide the education, well, the qualification that you need. So there was a whole campaign against anti-banding, there was a black parents movement, there was a campaign for anti-racist education, campaign for multicultural education. I could list off lots and lots of campaigns. Point is, there's been huge amounts of protest campaigns, etc., in the UK around this issue of education, around policing, whatever. One of the things that you have to then understand is that all positive changes in terms of racial relations have built, come about because of those grassroots movements. It's not that the government just decides one day we're going to have a race relations act that says you outlaw discrimination. That's because of pressure that was put on them by people, by communities, by, mo by mobilization. It's not, um, the poli policing is a really good example, right? So if you want to track police reform, the best way to look at it is to track the riots. Because after every riot is when you get a major police reform. Independent Police Complaints Commission, for example, only comes about after the 85 riots. Because once you have riot, movement, social pressure, that's when you get change. And the UK has a long history of, of and I'm sure we've talked about some of that today, and that's something we really, 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 really need to go back to. So in some ways you call it the British Civil Rights Movement, which is the way to talk about it. But the question I want to pose is, do we need a civil rights movement? Because this, this is the thing, when we don't talk about activism, we really don't talk about the differences in activism. Right, so there are so if we think about resistance, resistance can happen in many, many, many ways. You can have light resistance, you can have strong resistance, you can have reform, you can have revolution, and this is how you want. It's how I want to discuss the Black Elementary School movement, not just in relation to what it is, what did it work, but actually what's the politics behind it, and what does that tell us about the moment we're in today, and what we need to do going forward. And when we think about civil rights, uh, what is civil rights about, generally, broadly speaking? And it's, a bit more complicated, but I'm going to make it as simple as possible. Um, what do you think civil rights is about? Civil rights effectively is about reform, and it's about inclusion, right? So if you think about civil rights approaches, they're saying there's something wrong, the thing that's wrong with society is that we're not included in it, yeah? So the American example is the best example if you think about segregation, and you think about not having the right to vote, right? And so what African Americans are campaigning for, they're campaigning for the right to be part of, integrated, not to be segregated, and the right to have a vote to be included. Now, the assumption of civil rights is if you include us, and it's not just white people making the decisions, then you're going to have different decisions. So we come into the system, and then we can reform it, you can change it, you can change some of the laws, you can tweak things, etc., etc., etc. Now, that exact same approach as the pro was adopted uh, in the UK. So the campaigns uh, against anti-banding campaigns, for example, what is that? That's saying include us equally in the school system. The campaigns to have a different education, multicultural education, is include us in the system, right? You have also have campaigns around um, even bus boycotts. We sound very American, we had a bus boycott in Bristol. But it's all about how do we get into the system, how do we reform it, and how do we make it better? Right, so the problem with that is it assumes you can make the system better. And maybe you can't, right? And this is where I want to compensate. There's a different kind of politics. There's a radical version of politics that says, the system's the system. Can't, you can't change it. You can't improve it. The system isn't failing the children. The system is doing exactly what the system is supposed to do, right? And if you have, and if you look back 50 years, so it's 50 years since we've had really significant reform. And actually, in, in the UK and the US, it happens at around about the same time. So 65, you have the 60, 60, 64, 65 is the big civil rights legis legislation in the US, 65 is the Racial Relations Act in the UK, which outlaws discrimination. And then you have successive changes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 50 years later, look at all the statistics, and it's basically the same. It's, it's different, it's a bit different, but it's largely the same, right? You may have people like me in good jobs, et cetera, et cetera, but most people that look like me at my age aren't doing anywhere near as good as I am. In fact, in some places, there's 40% black male youth unemployment in this country, 40%. Right? That's like crisis level, third world level of unemployment that really we don't talk about very much. Yeah. So once you, well the radical challenge is to say that actually the system doesn't fail when it does this and when we have the same problems that we had previously as we have now, this isn't because there's something wrong with the system, this is just what it's supposed to look like. Right? Does that make sense? 
That's what it's supposed to be. So if that's what it's supposed to be, shouldn't we be trying to do something different? Which segues me perfectly into publishing, publicizing my uh, latest book. <laughs> <laughs> I thought long and hard about it. So I'm, I'm, no, no, but I think, I think this is so, and this, this is all about, so this, this book is about the politics of, of black radicalism. So what does that mean? What does black radicalism mean? And what does it mean, not just what does it mean, Historically, what does it mean today? What does that politics look like right now? And how do we go and enact it? And hopefully, I'm going to use this exact. I'm going to use the Saturday school movement as an example. And actually, saying that supplementary schools or Saturday schools, as I keep flipping back and forth between that, are are you can see both the limits of the prop, of, of, of our struggle that we've done, and also the potential of our struggle as well. So, if we go back to Saturday schools, um, there's always been, and this is where. It's not like Saturday schools. Saturday schools really are not one thing. They're many different things. Right? We call it as a movement, but it's, it's really two different movements it's in many ways. Right? There is, on the one hand, the kind of official movement of supplementary schools, which is more about saying, it's, how do we make sure that our children succeed in the mainstream schools? Remember, what's the reason for Saturday schools? The reason is that our kids are failing. They're coming out of the school with no qualifications. My dad left school with no qualifications, not one qualification at all. Right? And so, a big push of this movement is say, well, how do we get the kids to succeed? Which is why they teach maths, English, sometimes science, etc., etc. Why, if you go into a Saturday school today, you're, f you're going to find mainstream textbooks, homework, etc., etc. Because that's the point, right? And you have that official, and it's sort of difficult to talk about them as two different things because it happened, they cross over as well. But there's the general trend that says, this is what we're trying to do, uh, official um, places. If you go into the Saturday schools, they kind of mimic the mainstream school, oftentimes they've got teachers, like mainstream teachers. They set up like a classroom. It's exactly the same as school. It's just more school, right? It's a school on a Saturday or school after school. You can see this trend actually very much so in America. America does this really well. So I think LeBron James just opened a school. What's the biggest difference to the school? It's just long. It's a long day. Like you just go to school for, long, long, for a much longer period of time, right? The idea being there's a deficit within the student. And if you go to school more, then you can overcome the deficit. Does that make sense? This really is the basic principle of this. America does it all the time. And the UK, we start to do it with what we call extended schools. Just give people more school, and they'll catch up, basically. And so within the Saturday school movement, there's a big, big trend of just giving people more school. Um, mainstream curriculum, mainstream teachers. A lot of Saturday schools never taught black history. So that's, that's not always been a part of all Saturday schools. And it's not a part of all Saturday schools today. Um, in fact, if you go into Saturday schools today, most of them look more like homework, homework clubs than they look like anything else, right? And in some ways, actually, what black people have done is we've kind of over-mimicked the mainstream school. There's like a really conservative trend in the schools where what we do is we say, well, actually, you know, we need to be more severe. So it's not just more school, it's hard, being harsher, it's more rote learning, etc. I've been in Saturday schools which are like going back to the 60s version of what a school is. Um, and this picks up on a trend generally within, black, within the black community where, and I always tell this story, but when Dave, it was just before David Cameron became Prime Minister, he came to Birmingham and he was on New Style Radio, it's a local radio station, and the presenter's Caribbean guy, as well known in the community, spends the whole time asking him, what, when you get into power, what are you going to do to the, fix the school? And his basic question was, when are you going to bring back the cane? Because that's what we need, we need to be beaten into learning. That's the solution to the problems of black people and schooling, right? It tells you that at the core is a really conservative argument that says there's something wrong with us, right? There's something wrong with us. We need to be beaten. We're not being beaten properly. And so, and you can see this very clearly in Saturday school. The Saturday schools say, well, we need to send our kids back to like the old Jamaican schools. Jamaican schools are wonderful because they beat, you beat, you get beaten, right? <laughs> you can, <laughs> I'm not even joking, is it? You can correct the kids by beating them effectively. And this, is happens, this happens a lot. This, ha this is not even a small part. This is a big trend you see nowadays, right? Uh, people send their kids to, to Jamaica now for the same reason. It's stricter, it's, it's, it's more control. Da -da 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 -da. And so what you find is we tend to, we have tended in some senses to um, not just mimic the schools, but actually make the school, make, make, make it far worse in a sense, right? And I remember, remember Maureen Stone? Schools are like colonizers. Another quote of Maureen Stone is, left-wing teachers have done more harm than good to black children. Right? Maureen Stone is one of the most conservative people you'll ever hear write about schools, ever. Ever, 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 ever. Uh, her, basic, her basic philosophy is that there's something, black kids need more school, need stricter school, uh, parents are a big part of the problem, um, and this, 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 not, this, this left-wing nonsense is, is ridiculous, right? Rote learning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
which should which doesn't really stand in together with uh, schools are like colonizers, etc. argument, right? Which is important because at, back in the day you had this argument that the schools were the problem. Nobody would de would deny the schools were the problem because they were so obviously the problem. What's happened now is that's kind of disappeared and the schools are no longer the problem. Who do you think the problem is? If the schools aren't the reason that black children are failing, who is the reason that black children are failing? It's the individual, it's the parent, it's the children, it's the culture, right? It's the dads, because obviously the dads aren't there, so that's why the kids are failing, right? We see those arguments all the time, all the time, all the time. And in many ways, that's kind of become the, pre the predominant argument within Black elementary school. So actually, I went in, I interviewed about 15, 20, I think it was like 20, I think all together, because I did masses on this as well, about 20 different Saturday schools that are currently running in Birmingham and London. And pretty much every, every single one, one person who ran a school said, it's the parents. Parents are the problem, parents are the problem, parents are the problem. That the school is the problem had just kind of fallen into the background, and it was the parents, very, 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 very much so. The problem, which tells us that something has happened within, within the movement. Um, the other thing that you tend to find is this psychological approach. So even when there is history, it's why do you want to teach black children history? It's because their psychology has been damaged, and if you can fix their psychology by telling them about African kings and queens, then they'll do better in school. All right, and that sounds quite simplistic, but that really is the simplistic nature of the argument. There is something wrong with the children, not something wrong with the school. And actually what Saturday school is about is about palliative care uh, or nursing triage care for the students. So what you tend to find, so what you find very quickly is that by the 80s, 70s, 80s, the education authorities have come on board. Uh, the ILEA, we used to be the ILEA in London Education Authority, uh, is a conference in 83, said that supplementary schools should be a permanent feature of our provision. Right? These fit very nicely. These conservative trends fit very nicely into the schools. Right? Schools can't teach black kids, so pff, that's fine. We send them to Saturday school. They'll go teach them. Yeah? In fact, extended schools, which they were bringing in, are, are effectively Saturday schools in that, in that version. Right? So that's the kind of more conservative, civil rights, if you like, approach. Now, that within the movement, there was also a more radical version of supplementary education, uh, which was generally called the self-help. We call it self-help, right? And this was centered more on the idea that there's something wrong with the schools, there's something wrong with the education, there's something wrong with the curriculum, and we're going to teach just different things, right? So it, the best example would be one of the Saturday schools in Birmingham would teach Marxist-Leninism. It would like, literally have whole classes on what is Marxist-Leninism, how, how do you do that? Right, uh, would talk, have links to the Panthers. Uh, would have talk. Would would take like uh, black feminist texts. Would take Garvey's texts and have those. Those would be the different texts which you could use. And would really say, well, look, this is something wrong with the, something wrong with the system. How do we do this? It was not funded by the state. Um, one of the very earliest Saturday schools was started by a community organization called the African Caribbean Self Help Organization, uh, which still exists and is is a sort of radical. We're going to actually talk about it in the book. So if anybody wants to know why I said it was sort of radical, um, you can find the answer there. But a sort of radical organization of young people who just said, we're going to do something differently. And when they actually went out to the churches and asked for support for the schools, uh, what do you think the church said? There's no way. Mainstream teachers didn't want to know. Um, the police would actually, the police would go around and knock on people's doors, parents' doors, and say, do not send your child to the Saturday school. Like, it literally was a properly... Uh, the state, but what is one of the leaders of the school said? The state wanted to smash us, to destroy us, because we were critical engagement. Uh, we were really changing kind of the whole point of the school was to get them into different kind of politics. In some ways, it was similar to the Black Panther Liberation Schools, where the Black Panther Liberation Schools is all about teaching you how to do revolution. So this, there's this kind of different trend. Now I don't want to overstate it because that's like, like that's like one school, and most of the schools weren't like that. Like really, really weren't like that. But within that, you can see there is a there is a possibility to do something different, right? That actually, the purpose of the Saturday school isn't just to get people into mainstream education. The purpose of the Saturday school is to change how people are, to change what we do, to change how we, to change to change our politics, right? Um, now I actually went to that school. So for my PhD, I went to that school, uh, taught in that school, and I have to say, it was one of the most depressing things I've ever done. Because it just all that gone, like the radical gone, it disappeared, it's gone, hundred percent gone. None of that was there at all. What they had was mainstream school textbooks, uh, mainstream books. Um, it was just all mainstream school. And other than the fact that they had um, African education, African-centered education, and African-centered education, unfortunately, often just turns around the idea of culture, right? So it's how do we teach a different culture? Uh, how do we teach different spirit spirituality? And in some ways, that's very, very similar to a religious school, right? To a Sunday school. You're saying there's a different spirituality, there's a different culture you can engage. But it doesn't challenge the mainstream system really at all. It doesn't provide you with a revolutionary education. 
Um, and it fits, really does fit nicely and squarely into mainstream provision. In fact, some of the Saturday schools which are most uh, praised now are these kind of cultural schools, uh, which just teach, so there are actually schools now that just do culture. It's just African drumming or African dancing or something like that, which is not bad. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it's not a revolutionary thing, right? And they become kind of part of that, that, that state as well. So in some ways, just what I'm basically arguing is the kind of radical potential of Saturday schools disappeared. You won't find it. It's gone. It's literally gone. I see why I started doing a different project after the after after I did the did that book, because you just don't find that revolutionary spirit in the movement anymore. And there's many reasons we can go into that. I'm not going to go into. It. So, what I want to talk about is what can that history tell us about what we need to do today? Because everything I just told everything I told you previously about the '60s still basically applies now with the school system, right? You still have massive inequalities in terms of. GCSE attainment, particularly for black young people. You still have um, people who are, well, you people have three times more likely to be expelled. If you look at what's happening with, you know, people referral units, you know, people referral units, the, those are the places where once they've decided you can't learn, basically, they take you out of the school and put you in a people referral unit. And some of them are wonderful, but most of them are terrible. And they're, they're generally ungoverned. Nobody really cares about them at all. And there's some, I had one student who went into one. It was like a prison. Like they literally just put you in a room by yourself, leave you for a day, and then you go come out and go. And they kept, they kept collect the money, right? And all the evidence tells you, if you go to people who are a referral unit, you're more likely to go to prison than to do anything else. That basically is school to prison pipeline in the United Kingdom. And it is populated overwhelmingly uh, by black young people. So the problem is still there. Right? They haven't gone away. So the question is, what do we need to do about it? Right? And similarly to the time we had the Saturday schools, uh, we kind of have that same moment now. And in some ways, that moment has is, is arisen because of universities. And I was the point, universities are just as bad. Uh, in fact, universities are, <laughs> universities are worse. Jeez. The inequalities in universities are worse than the inequalities in schools. Far worse. In many ways, not even far, not, just far worse. So for example, in schools, you can, if there is no general attainment discrimination for white and non-white, right? Some non-white groups do really well, and some don't do very well, it kind of averages it, right? In university, not the case. If you're not white, you do significantly less well than if you're white, even students who do really well in school, right? So there's clearly something happening in the university which isn't happening in school and is in some ways more insidious, right? If you look at dropout rates, completion rates, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so, and that now has come back on the agenda, on the table, because students are pushing this and saying, actually, what do we do differently? How do we change this, et cetera, et cetera. So we're in a good moment to have this discussion about how do we fix the schools. Or, and again, and this is where I want to give you the radical argument. Radical argument says, actually, I'm going to ask you, what do you think? What do you think the radical answer to this is? What do we do about the schools? Do we train the teachers? Hmm? Like we train the teachers and make it part of their learning and training. Make what part of the learning and training? Um, ability to teach children that are not white. Could be, potentially. What do you think? Is that a radical argument? I'm, I'm, I'm going to point out. Point out I've never been trained ever in 18 years how to teach children that have got any quote-unquote ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Never. Okay, so this is a good idea, right? So it would be a good idea to retrain teachers. But it's a liberal, it's, it's a more of a civil rights idea, right? There's, there's something wrong, you can change the teacher, you can reform it, right? Yeah, but it's not, it's not a bad idea. Because like, basically, I spend the whole entirety of his book just saying that's, a, that's, that's not radical, but it doesn't mean it's not a good idea. There's, those are different things. Right, so, but the radical answer to this really is to say, well, the schools, are the, the schools aren't fixable. They're not fixable. You can't do anything about it. The school is the school. And as you can train and teach as much as you like, you're still going to get the same response. You're still going to get the same result at the end of it because the point of the school is not to make equality. The point of the school is to retrench all the inequalities that you see in society, be they class, gender, or race. That's the purpose of our school system. That's why it looks the way it looks, right? Now, once you make that argument, which is fair enough to make, yeah, there's another question is what do you do about it, right? How do, what do we do about it? And this is, this is where I think we have to then, then think about different ideas. What we do about it then is we don't rely on the school. And why would you rely on the school to educate your child? I, I don't really understand. And what I say, I say to everybody, I do, the things I currently get paid to do, I never learned in school. At least I never learned one of them in school. Like not one thing that I now write about and talk about and get paid to do that I ever learned in school. Learn that from other places. Saturday school, community, books. There's a whole range of places you can go and get yourself educated. And we have to start seeing, we have to start seeing school as what it is, which is a place to get a credential to move on in your life. That is all it is, right? And it's a game that you play to get the credentials. And the credentials are important, 
But the schooling you're getting is not important. And it actually generally isn't important because I don't think I remember anything I learned at school at all. Very little, very little of it. Other than reading and writing and counting, which I think are quite important skills, what, what is it that you really pick up and learn in school? So the point, so a radical, a radical approach to education is let's do something differently. Let's actually say, well, how do we take control of our education and teach what we need to teach, right? Because what we need to teach can't be taught in the school. It can't really be taught in university. Because what we need to teach is a, is a what Malcolm calls I mean, the program of political re-education to open up children, our people's eyes to the truth. And the truth is that this system can no more provide freedom, justice, and equality for black people than a chicken can lay a duck egg. That's a Malcolm X quote. I can't take credit for it. All right? And so once we understand that, we have to do something different, right? And that education is really important, isn't it? Education is the first thing because we don't know hardly any of these things. But when we think about education, we should be thinking about spaces, and this is where the Saturday School Movement is important, thinking about spaces outside of the mainstream, thinking about spaces that we control ourselves, thinking about spaces that are in the community or um, aren't funded by the state. But we can do, generate a whole entire different curriculum, a whole entire different level of understanding. All right? And that's kind of the challenge of what we're trying to do. In fact, and why I, bought, I actually bought some copies of this book, uh, because this is one of the things we're doing. So the, I'm really good at like selling books, like, yeah, but tying it in, I really do. I try really hard at this. So, <laughs> no, no, so one of the things that we do, so one of the things, one of the purposes of this book actually, in terms of black radicalism, is we've started an organization, Harambe Organization of Black Unity. This isn't just a theoretical idea. This is Malcolm X started the organization of African American Unity before he died. There's a platform of it, there's a program of it. It's, it's, a, it's really, 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 it's a great idea. So we just picked up the idea and said, well, let's do that today. And one of the things is education. Education is the thing we started on, say that we need to have a program of political re-education, something different. And so the book says, we need black radicalism, what is black radicalism, and basically makes the argument for the organization. And one of the things I'm doing today is I've managed to bootleg some copies of the book, um, and the, all the proceeds goes to, we're starting the Marcus Garvey Education Center in Hansworth, in Birmingham, which has a long history of about 70, uh, 50, 30 years, sorry, 30 years, 40 years, sorry. <laughs> I don't even know. I'm not, you know, I'm not a historian, so I don't know. Yeah, like, it was a while ago. <laughs> so, it, no, it started in 74, that's where I got coffee. Opened in 74, the Marcus Garvey Nursery. Uh, came into financial problems about 10 years ago, and we're trying to get it reopened. So, £15 for a book if you want to buy one, and all the money goes to um, that course. Um, but the point of that is, and I think that's a lesson from the Saturday School Movement, is what did, there was a point in time where people found that the schools were harmful to their children. They, didn't, they did go and protest, right? They did go and try to get the schools to change, and the schools did change. But alongside doing that, they said that we are going to have to educate our own children. And they went out and educated their own children. There's a whole generation of people who literally wouldn't be where they are today without the Saturday School Movement. In fact, the Carla, if you read the Carla's book, uh, Natives, has a, it keeps talking about it. I went to my Saturday School, I learned this, I went to my Saturday School, I learned that. Without that, you don't have a Carla. You just don't, it wouldn't exist. It'd be, it'd be someone which is lost somewhere, right? And those are the kind of things that we need to support in this moment. It's not all about what the state can do. Sometimes it's about what we can do. And that's the message we should take forward. Thank you. Do you think that when it comes to like a primary education system, because I don't know school in the state, so I don't know how it's broken up like primary school, middle school, high school, mm -hmm. before primary school, do, don't you think that um, radicalism, black radicalism can be taught in schools, like especially when it comes to certain communities because like in the states, like in inner city neighborhoods, we have like a lot of charter schools which are already types of schools that people are not very fond of, but like they work in a lot of inner city mm -hmm. neighborhoods because like my mom's a social worker um, in a lot of the charter <coughs> schools and they don't teach direct black um, uh, radicalism, but they do teach them about their place in society and they do teach them about um, systemized oppression you know because a lot of at, at the end of the day most of the, most of the kids see their teachers more than they see their parents you know and I think that if there's a mix between like parents being able to teach their kids and also teachers taking responsibility for knowing their children's place in society I think that it could be a mix of both especially if they have the tools to do that you know I think that there's already going to be a set of tools that the teachers are going to have to teach the kids that have come from the state, which is, it is what it is. But I think that there's also projects that, uh, there's projects that teachers could do with the kids and the type of language they can use when they're with the kids to kind of keep them in a certain type of mindset that they don't have to focus just what's, up, what's on the book, but know that they have to pass those exams to continue on. 
Yeah, so I mean, one of the arguments that we've made is we want to start a, a black school, effectively, right? And you, you, in theory, you can do that with the law. You can go, we've got free schools here. Uh, so you could, in theory, do it, right? Problem is, state's funding the thing, right? And state doesn't like to fund things which are radical. All right, so and then school, there have been people who've tried to start, I wouldn't say similar, but it's kind of, kind of, they say similar ideas, and they haven't got the money, haven't got the funding. It's been told now, that's a terrible idea, right? But it doesn't mean it's not possible, and I think it's certainly possible. I think the problem is, and if you look at a lot of the charter schools in the States, if you look at the historically black colleges and universities, even, they just tend to, more than, often than not, they tend to mimic the mainstream values. Even when they're positive things. So for example, I said LeBron James's school, it's, a, it's not a bad thing. Who's going to say it's a bad thing that you're getting people into school, you're getting them college, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But look at the general philosophy of it. It's not, it's not a radical philosophy. And I think that often we don't find that within these movements. And that doesn't mean it's not possible. It's definitely possible. It's definitely something we should aim for. But I think that's been, it has to be embedded into the politics of what you're doing because it's very, it's very easy to drift into something else, I think. So I think, I think on a basic principle, we should say that black young people since, well, let's say, let's, let's just say the UK, let's just take the last, what, 50 years in the UK, right? All the evidence will tell you that black young people, the school is bad for black young people from 65 to today. In fact, I can show you, a, it's a graph that shows that on a when they do the attainment things, when black children enter school, they're generally a bit higher attainment wise in terms of these little attainment things. And every year it goes down, 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 until the end of the, end of the school, they're at the bottom. Right? So it's actually something about the school itself. Now, certainly, I mean, look, I grew, geez, I, grew up, I, I went to school. I understand, I understand how that plays out. And there is, what, there is a, it would be wrong to say there's not an anti-school culture for some black people. There is, right? Who's been called a coconut or a bounty bar because you did well in school, right? Those things happen. Those exist. Those are real things, right? But is that the problem? No, that's a symptom of the problem. Of course, black young people are rejecting school because the school rejects black young people. It's a logical thing to do. That's why it's, 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 the, it's the thing you should do. In fact, the school is anti-black people. So why would you want to make school cool? The school's bad for you, right? Generally speaking. And so, and when and I, and I say that, not to be glib, right? Because you do have to attack, you do have to attack the anti, not the anti-school culture. The, there's the conflation of school and education. Those are different things. So for those young black people who say that school, we don't like school, I'd go fair enough, you shouldn't like school. But you should love education, which is a different thing, right? And once you love education, that will allow you to play the game in school. Because that's the problem. There is, a, there is definitely, there is that culture exists and it's, and it's negative and it's harmful. But the solution to that isn't to get young people to fully embrace the school, it's to do something else. And also, even if we all did embrace the school, do you really think that's going to make a difference? Like, really? That's not going to change. The way the people first, when first Caribbean kids came to the schools, there was no anti-school culture. They just came to school and went to school. And what happened? They came out with no education or qualifications. So it's not the solution. It's a symptom. And so I talk about this a lot in the book. It's symptom. There are many symptoms to the problem, but the problem is the system itself. We got Tommy Gundo? Yeah. We finished? Yes. All right. Well, we're going to end. I will over time. Thank, Thank you. you. If you want to buy a book, I'm going to bet. Thanks.